Let's see, there we are. Let's take our Bibles and open to the book of Luke, chapter 7, beginning in verse 30. The title of our message this morning is Responding to the Lord. Very important for us to understand because it has so much application in our lives today. Let's ask the Lord's blessing and then just receive from His Word. Father, thank You. Thank You for Your Word. Thank You for the strength of it in our lives and how it transforms us. Our prayer this morning is that You would just pour Your Word into our soul and ignite our faith and increase our love after you as we read through this and receive from your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, responding to the Lord. Last week, at the beginning part of this chapter, we were seeing an amazing revelation and insight into how a believer can have an effective spiritual life. And I don't know about you, but that excites me. I want to understand the Lord's word and the Lord's strength in my life and to have the effective life that he speaks about. But remember that it came from understanding what it means to be under the authority of God well. To be under the authority of God's word well. Now what do, he, what do we mean when we say under his authority well? Well it means that we're not kicking against it. We're not resisting. We're not chafing against it. We're not, you know, kicking against the goads, the Scripture says. The principle, if you remember, was revealed from the Roman centurion. Roman centurion had the faith to believe. Now, notice how it's connected to faith. He had the faith to believe that Jesus had the authority to speak the word, simply speak the word, and his servant would be healed. He explained that the principle was this. He believed by faith that Jesus was under the authority of his Father well, and therefore he had authority to speak the word, and his servant would be healed. Now, Jesus declared that was amazing faith. And that is, in fact, a, an amazing declaration for us to understand. Jesus does have authority. In fact, remember in Matthew 28, he says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And so, see, this becomes an exceptionally important and powerful principle for us to understand. It's practical. It's personal. If we would understand what it means to come under the authority of God's word well, to come under the authority of our Lord well, it has everything to do with the effectiveness of our prayers and the authority of who we are in Jesus Christ. Now, when we get to this next section, beginning in verse 30, it gives us deeper insight into this principle, and it has to do with being under that authority and responding, responding to the Lord as we are under that authority. See, this is what we're going to understand. Beginning in verse 30, there's a very important principle. And it's for us very practical. We could say it this way. Accept God's purpose in your life. Receive it. Welcome it. Be delighted in God's purpose in your life. When you're under God's authority and you're under his authority well, you receive his purpose and delight in it. Notice what it says in verse 30. The Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves. Now, when you see the word lawyers there, you should think about a person who is an expert in the Old Testament law. That's what it means, lawyer, Old Testament law. So here you have an expert in the Old Testament law who has rejected God's purpose for their lives. Now, that should be a rather shocking uh, statement. And so you look at this, it's interesting, the scene that's laid out for us, because Jesus had been speaking about John the Baptist. And many in the crowd acknowledged the rightness or the justice of God's words, but the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose. So now, there's an insight, isn't it? Because we don't want to be as that, where we reject, but we want to accept, and in fact, delight in God's purpose. You might say, well then, what is God's purpose? And I think that it's several 
aspects of that that we need to understand. For example, to accept God's purpose in our lives is to understand that God calls the tune. This is what I mean. Follow in verse 31. Jesus is going to give a parable or a picture. Jesus speaks and he says, Now to what then shall I compare the men of this generation? And what are they like? Now he's speaking here about the leaders of this generation, the Pharisees, the lawyers, Sadducees, etc. And he said, They are like children who sit in the marketplace and they call to one another and they say, Hey, we played the flute for you, but you wouldn't dance. We sang a dirge. Uh, a dirge is a, uh, a song you would sing at a funeral. Uh, we sang a dirge for you, but you would not weep. He explains. For John the Baptist has come, eating no bread, drinking no wine, and then you say, he's got a demon. But then the Son of Man has come, eating and drinking. See the opposite. But then you say, behold, he's a gluttonous man and a drunkard and a friend of tax gatherers and sinners. Oh, but wisdom is vindicated by her children. See, Jesus illustrates his point, beginning in verse 31, by comparing that generation uh, to children who sit in the marketplace and play this game. And you can imagine this game, right, where one plays uh, a flute uh, uh, like that or an instrument, and then the other kids will dance to it. Or uh, someone will sing this song and the other kids will respond to it. And that's kind of the, the, the picture. But in this illustration, they don't dance. Now what can this mean? He's talking about the, the, this children's game. And the question is, in the children's game, who is responding to whom? Now I play a game like this with our grandkids. And uh, you all remember, perhaps when you were young, the song... Uh, when you're happy and you know, clap your hands. You guys remember that song? I've contemporized it. I've made it modern and new. And my grandkids love this song. Okay? And it's, it's a great picture of this very principle. Right? You remember this song, right? So it goes like this. If you're happy and you know, clap your hands. Okay, come on, you guys. Let's work together here. All right? If you're happy and you know, clap your hands. Okay, now you guys are on to it. So, the way it works is, see, I sing, and they clap. We're driving down the car, uh, down the road in the car, and I'm singing along, and, uh, you know, they're clapping in the back, but I made it contemporary. So I'll go like this. If you're happy and you know it, roar like a lion. And they go, Look at These are kids, right? Three, four, five, six, and love it. I mean, it is so fun. Do it again, Grandpa, do it again. If you're happy and you know it, you know, bark like a dog. Rip, rip. And then, very good. And then we go, if you're, if you're tired and you know it, give a yawn. Uh, they love it. I do that one at night when it's time for bed. And then, if you're sad and you know it, cry your tears. And they go, uh. Kids love it. You can be friends of kids by doing that song. But here's the point. It's just like what Jesus is saying. Because the point is, who responds to whom? I'm singing, they're clapping, or they're roaring, or whatever. You see the point of the song. Now, how does Jesus apply it to them? Well, it's like this. The Pharisees and the lawyers didn't want to respond to God's word. They wouldn't respond to it. They wouldn't come under the authority of it. They wouldn't respond to God's word, although they were experts in the law. Don't you find that rather shocking? They are supposedly experts at the law, experts at the word of God, but they will not come under the word of God. There's something wrong here. There's something out of order here. Oh, yes, there is. They wanted God to respond to them. They wanted to determine the thing. They wanted to set the rules of the thing. That's out of order. And the end result of that will be disaster. As it was for them, it will be for anyone. See, anyone who thinks that they can call the tune and that God's going to respond will be sorely disappointed. Whenever I think of this scripture, I think of an occasion when I was in Bible school <clears throat> and I was 
waiting tables in this restaurant. And one day, uh, me, uh, this other waiter and I were in the back in the kitchen getting something ready, and we're in this conversation, and he says, Hey, Rich, you're in Bible college, aren't you? And I said, Yeah. And he said, Hey, say something religious. When he said that, there was something in my soul that says, That's not right. That's not right. But I looked at him and I said, Jesus was arrested once. And he stood before Herod. And Herod insisted that he do some kind of miracle so as to impress him. But Jesus wouldn't dance. And I will not dance before you either. And then he went, oh, why do you have to be so serious all the time? I said, because God is worthy of our respect. That's why. Don't trifle with God and don't trifle with God's word. Don't you think that God is worth our respect? See, when, when, when God sent John the Baptist, notice what Jesus explains. When God sent John the Baptist, they rejected his word. They would not come under his word. They rejected it. We're talking about the leaders. So when God sent his only son, they rejected him as well. Would you like a great scripture? Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3. That he might make you understand. Man does not live by bread alone. But man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Do you want to live? you want life? Here's a great promise. Here's a great scripture. Man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. What a wonderful insight. And so therefore, if we would come under the authority of God's word and delight in it, oh, what wondrous, significant transformation it would be in our lives. Now, let's look at the scripture because there's another important principle. When you, it talks about accepting God's purpose, and asking the question, well, what is God's purpose in our lives? One of the things we need to see is that God's purpose is that we become like our teacher. That's God's purpose. That we become like our teacher. Who's our teacher? The Son of God, Jesus Christ. In verse 35, Jesus said, wisdom is vindicated by her children. In other words, wisdom is seen. And the results, the effect in our lives. You see, to accept God's purpose and to come under the authority of God's word well means that we become like our teacher because we're under his instruction. And his words become our words. His heart becomes our heart. Oh, the wisdom of that is seen in the wondrous, amazing Christ-like changes that come into our lives and the wonderful blessing that follows. If we are transformed into our, the image of our teacher, we are the ones that are blessed because of that. And I suggest even those that are around us are blessed. When we are transformed, it blesses everyone around us. Some scriptures. 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. The one who abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. How about Philippians 2, 5? Have this attitude of heart in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Hey, at our Wednesday service, we looked at a psalm. Psalm 112. I want to show you this psalm because it speaks to this so powerfully. Let's turn there. Psalm 112. Turn there. <clears throat> I'm not going to read the whole psalm, but I want to highlight some of it. Again, because it is so right on target with what we're looking at here. Notice how it begins. Psalm 112, verse 1. Praise the Lord. Notice this. How blessed. How blessed is the man who fears the Lord. That word fears means reveres, respects, stand in awe, honors. How blessed. You are blessed. Notice what it says. The one who greatly delights in his commandments. Well, what does it mean, commandments? Well, instructions. 
the word that he gives us for our lives. And what it says is that man will greatly delight in it. Why does he delight in it? He's not chafing against it. He's not resisting it. He's delighting in it. Well, why does he delight in it? Because he knows that the favor of God is poured out through it. He knows that God's favor is poured out on his life, and the results in his life are to be greatly desired. And therefore, he's delighting in being under that word. Notice the result, because the rest of the chapter gives us the result in the man's life, or the woman. His descendants will be mighty on the earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house. Why? Because he's got the wisdom of the Lord. He has the strength of the Lord in the wisdom that he brings. And his righteousness endures forever. Light arises in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious. See, the one who's under the word of God is gracious. Why? Because God says, be gracious. Give grace, and it'll come back to you. Be merciful, and, and you will receive mercy. He is gracious. He's compassionate. He's righteous. Notice verse 5. It is well with the man who is gracious and lends. He will maintain his cause in judgment. That means he conducts his affairs justly. I like verse 6. He will never be shaken. Why not? He will never be shaken because he's got a foundation. He trusts in the Lord and there's a foundation in his life. Remember what Jesus said. He who listens to my word and lives by those words is like a man building his house on a strong foundation. And when the storm came, it did not uh, 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 break down the house because it was well built. But notice this. Verse 6. He will never be shaken and the righteous will be remembered forever. What does that mean? It means that, that he has a great reputation. See, the result of God moving in our lives is that we then have the character and the integrity and the, the aspect of his character seen in our lives. And therefore, people see it. Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be awesome if people looked at you and said, now there is a man of character and integrity. There is a woman right there. There is a woman of honor. And it's known. You know what the scripture says? Uh, a good name is better to be chosen than fine riches. A good name. Wouldn't it be marvelous if your kids saw your life, they saw how you lived your life, and they respected you for it? Wouldn't that be marvelous? I mean, look at what he's saying to us here. He's delighting in being under the Lord's word. And the result is seen. Notice verse 7. He will not fear evil tidings. Hey, evil tidings happen. But he's not afraid in the day of evil tidings. Well, why not? Because his heart is steadfast. That's why. Trusting in the Lord. Because he knows that when he is under the authority of God's word, then the authority of God resides upon his life. You see the principle? Very powerful, isn't it? And there we understand his heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is upheld. He will not fear. Look at verse 9. He has given freely to the poor. He's gracious. He's generous. His righteousness endures forever, and his horn in Scripture, that talks about authority and power and strength. His horn will be exalted in honor. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and He will exalt you. Great promises, wondrous Scripture, and there's the point that we see. Now, let's go back to Luke chapter 7. But when it comes to accepting God's purpose and understanding God's purpose in our lives, one of the things we need to see then is that it means also responding by loving much. See, when we're under his word, we receive greatness of his love and we love much. Notice what it tells us in verse 36 and following. This is a story about when a Pharisee named Simon invited Jesus to come to his house uh, to eat dinner. Now, 
I think it's going to be helpful for us to understand just a little bit of the culture of the day. For when they sat at this table, it's not like our tables. You know, we have tables, uh, you know, about waist high. You put chairs underneath them and tuck your legs underneath. Very different in their culture. In their day, the table would sit off the ground not more than about that high. And what would happen is that you would kind of lean on a cushion and then eat, you know, with one hand like this, but your feet would actually be sticking out, you know, behind you. Yeah, can you imagine all these feet sticking out? Can you imagine the square footage? Feet sticking out. Okay, that was not a very good one there. Okay, uh, sorry. But anyway, you get, you get the picture. Okay, so all these feet sticking out. When Jesus is in the house, there's a woman from the city who knows that he is there. She is a sinner, which is to say, she's a famous sinner. She's a woman of ill repute. I think you know what I'm saying. She comes into the house. She begins to cry, weep. She's weeping at his feet. Tears are falling uh, on, on his feet. She takes her hair. Now, this would have been very unseemly. She takes her hair, and it falls down, and she begins to wash his feet with her hair. She then begins to kiss his feet, and then she takes some perfume and anoints his feet. Now, when Simon sees this, he is indignant. As the scene unfolds, he's indignant. If this man really were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman that is. And he wouldn't let her touch him. That's the scene. All right, here we are, verse 36. One of the Pharisees was requesting Jesus to dine with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Now behold, there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume, probably the most expensive thing she owned. Now standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and then kept wiping them with the hair of her head, kissing his feet and anointing them with perfume. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him and that she is a sinner. Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he said, say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. Now, when they were unable to pay, he graciously forgave them both. Which of them, therefore, will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, You have judged correctly. And then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. But she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. And for this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And then he said to the woman, your sins have been forgiven. Forgiven. And those who were reclining at the table with them began to say to themselves, Who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Verse 50 is key. Your faith. Your faith. In other words, the woman had the faith to believe that Jesus had the authority to forgive her sins. And she believed that Jesus would love her. Now see, this is important, isn't it? 
She believed that he would love her and extend grace to her and extend compassion to her and offer the forgiveness that she so desperately needed. She believed that he would do it. And that's why she loved much. She was honest about her great sin. And she humbled herself under God's love. She humbled herself under God's grace. And she received it to the full. But then she responded to the full by loving much. Simon did not see what this woman saw. Simon didn't even offer the commonest courtesies of the day. The cultural expectation, the courtesy, common, everyone would do it. Uh, if a man was invited to dinner, when he came into your house, you would give him a basin to wash his feet. Now, in those days, they didn't have shoes and socks and stuff to protect their feet. So, you know, when they walked about, uh, they had these sandals, and you can just imagine what their feet would look like. You know, they're walking around, so they're kind of sweaty, they're kind of wet. And there's dust and there's dirt. You know, there's not pavement and concrete. They're out there walking in the dirt. And the animals are out there in the street. And the animals are, you know, animal refuse all mixed with the mud. And they're all walking through it. And they come into your house for dinner and your feet are black. No, you offer a basin of water. And then you would sit down on a little stool. And someone would come, usually a servant would come, and wash your guest's feet. And then have a little towel and just freshen it. Can you imagine how that would feel? Your feet would just feel so fresh. And it's just common courtesy. Everyone would do it. Simon didn't give the commonest courtesies. Didn't respect him. Which is to say he wasn't coming under anything. He didn't give him a kiss. In those days, culturally, a man would kiss a man's cheek to greet him. Scripture says, greet each other with a holy kiss. He didn't give him the commonest courtesy of respect by giving him a kiss on the cheek. He dishonored him by withholding it. The woman kissed his feet. How awesome is that? She washed his feet with her tears. How honoring is that? She dried his feet with her hair. How honoring is that? It was very common in those days to provide some oil for your hair. See, it's important for us to understand that in those days, they didn't have showers like we have showers today. It was very unusual to even have a bath available. And so you can imagine what your hair would look like when you got up in the morning, right? So what you would do is just take some oil, and then you just kind of run it through your hair, and you're all fresh for the day. Wouldn't well, it be great if you could do that? Oil your hair down. It looked cool in those days, you know, oil the hair like that. But when you went to somebody's house, they offered you an opportunity to freshen up. We do the same thing. If you visit somebody, they would often say to you, you want to freshen up? Common. It's courtesy. To not provide it is to disrespect. So Jesus is pointing it out. She anointed my feet with perfume. Simon did not see what this woman saw. Therefore he loved not at all. John 14, 23 is key. Jesus said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my words. Do you love the Lord? See, this is a very important and personal thing, isn't it? Yeah, I love the Lord. Well, Jesus said, if you love me, the one who loves me will keep my words. Which is to say, he will be underneath them because they have strength, they have power, they have authority. Yeah, I love. If anyone loves me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our abode with him. But then he says, but he who does not love me does not keep my words. Here's Matthew 22, verse uh, 36 to 38. We love these verses. I love quoting them because they're so important for our lives. Someone said to him, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? 
they had all kinds of debates. The lawyers of the day, which is the greatest commandment? Well, this law is higher than that law. But this law is higher than that law. And they started categorizing which is the greatest of them all was, of course, the question of the day. So Jesus answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the greatest and the foremost of all commandments. This is responding by loving God much. When you know you've been forgiven much, when you are honest enough about it to know that you've been forgiven much, and I'm telling you, I know I've been forgiven much. When you know you've been forgiven much, you love much. When God's grace has been poured out to you, you want to respond by loving Him in, in return. Now, last thing. Notice the next chapter. Because what we're going to see is a very important application to our lives. What does it mean? It means to welcome God's Word in your heart. To understand God's purpose and to respond to Him means to welcome God's Word in your heart. Jesus said, if you love me, then you'll keep my word, you see. So therefore, what we do is we, we welcome God's words. We welcome the words of Jesus. I want to know them. I want to have them. Pour them into my life, Lord. And in chapter 8, beginning in verse 4, Jesus is going to give us here a famous parable, and it's about a farmer sowing his seed. Now, Jesus is going to explain that this parable is about God sowing the word of God, and that's the seed being sown. And then he says that uh, as the seed falls on the ground, that there's different kinds of ground, and that the different kinds of ground are, or soils picture for us the different kinds of hearts that are out there, and therefore the different kinds of responses to the word. Now, next week we're going to look at that in more detail. I just want to look at the first kind of soil. But picture in your mind how a farmer would, would, would sow his seed in those days. He'd have like a, let's say, a, a sack on his side, probably, probably strapped to his shoulder. And he'd reach into the bag and he'd kind of just throw it. And it would kind of go between the, the creases in his fingers so that it would kind of spread it out evenly, right? So you can just imagine the motion. And you're just going to throw it wide, right? You're just throwing the seed all out there. And, of course, some seed would fly. And so he's saying, hey... Along the, 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 the field would be a pathway, like hard pack. Everyone's walking on it, you know, and the animals and the carts and everything. And it's just like packed hard. And it's a picture for us of something very important. It pictures for us that some hearts are hard. They're packed hard. And, and therefore, because they're hard, they cannot receive the seed. The seed won't go in. It's a picture for us, isn't it, of hearts that are hard. They won't receive the Word of God. They're not interested in the Word of God. They reject the Word of God. They don't see it as authority, as blessing. They reject it. And therefore, they won't receive it, and they won't receive the blessings that come from it either. See, resistance to the Lord is always seen as rebelliousness or stubbornness. Heart of heart. Here's a great scripture. Jeremiah 18, verses 11 to 12. I love these verses because it's so on target. Thus says the Lord. You can almost hear the Lord calling this out. Oh, turn back each of you from his evil way. Reform your ways and your deeds. But they will say, it's hopeless. For we are going to follow our own plans. And each of us will act according to the stubbornness of his evil heart. Is that accurate or what? Oh man, if we could only know how great are the blessings that would come from receiving God's word into our heart, letting it go into the heart, welcoming God's word. Uh, a seed is an excellent illustration of the word of God. A seed. Can you imagine a wheat seed? It's filled with life, isn't it? If that seed will go into the ground... It will grow up and produce fruit 30, 60, 100 fold. It's a great picture, a seed. 
It's a great picture of, of the Word of God. Life. Uh, did you know... Okay, let's take a scientific sidebar. Did you know that human DNA has over 3 billion base pairs containing more than 750 megabytes of information? Aren't you amazed? But did you know that a wheat DNA, wheat DNA has 15 billion base pairs? Aren't you amazed? Isn't it amazing what evolution has done? I couldn't resist. I had to throw that in there. But see, here's the point. The Word of God cannot take root, cannot bring about the great results unless it goes into the heart, unless it penetrates into the heart. But he's talking about a soil that's hard. What makes a heart hard? I have some suggestions. One, arrogance. Arrogance is the condition where someone is convinced that their perspective is better than anyone else's. They're convinced that they know better than anybody else. Therefore, they're completely unteachable. I don't know if you've ever talked to somebody like this, but it is a very frustrating conversation. Somebody who's completely unteachable. Arrogance. You can talk to them and try to explain to them, man, man, the direction you're going is going to end in disaster. I think I know what I'm doing. It's going to be okay. No, it's not. I'm telling you right now that it's, a, it's really not going to go well for you. I think I've got it figured out, okay? I'm just tell, here to tell you that you don't have it figured out. I think God's Word has a better... Don't be telling me that kind of stuff. I think I know what I'm doing. And you just so want to help them to see, no, you don't, my friend. They're totally unteachable. Now, we, you see, when someone's unteachable, they're not under God's Word. They're not under the authority of God's Word. They're self-authority. That, my friends, is disaster. Here's a great scripture. Proverbs 12, verse 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. Wow. Is that strong or what? I know it's a strong word, but it's right. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. He listens. He's teachable. I want to know the truth. I want to know the right way. Proverbs 21, 2. We read it last week. Every man's way is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. Here's another suggestion for what makes a heart hard. Bitterness. There are people who have been so hurt, they simply cannot let go. They just cannot let go of it. But they don't understand that they are preventing the Word of God from bringing the fruit in their lives that God's Word's promising. Well, like what? Freedom. Freedom. Peace. Healing. See, it, it, they're not willing to come under God's Word. What does God's Word say to them? Don't allow a root of bitterness into your life. That's what God's Word says. Forgive. Let go. I don't want to let go. I'm going to demand justice but you're not going to receive the healing that He wants for you. The Word of God is right. He loves you. He wants you to be free. He wants you to let go so you to have the peace of God in your heart so that you can love God freely. Let go. When I think about that, one of the best stories I ever read was about Corrie Ten Boom. Many of you know her story. She went through the Holocaust. After the war, she uh, traveled much, spoke about it, wrote much. She wrote about an occasion when she was traveling through Europe, and she was in a train station, and in the crowd she saw a man that she recognized. It was one of the guards. 
And she said when she saw him, something just came over her, and it wasn't good. She just looked at him, but he saw her. He came over to her, and he said, I'd like to introduce myself. Oh, I know who you are. He said, I, I've heard you speak, and I've read what you've written, and I need to ask, please, I need you to forgive me. I was so, so wrong. Please, forgive me. And he put out his hand like this, and she said it was shaking. She said she stood there and watched him, and she saw his hand. And she knew that God's word had instructed her that she must take that hand. And so she said that she did it simply out of obedience. So she reached out and she took hold of the hand. She says the moment that she took hold of his hand, something happened. She said she could feel even her arm. Like there was a warmth that came through her arm and her whole body. She said she began to cry and she began to realize at that moment that God had even made this appointment for her so that she could be free. It was for her to be free of what she had been carrying with her. See, what we need it's for us to open our hearts, come under the authority of God's word, and come to the place where we open so that he pours. When he pours his word, he's pouring his life. He's pouring his spirit. When we say that we want the life of God, how do we get the life of God? Well, he pours his life into us. This is a great scripture. Ezekiel 36, verse 26. Moreover, I will give you a new heart. I will give you a new heart. I will pour my spirit within you, and I will remove that heart of stone, and I give you a heart of flesh. That's what we need. What a tragedy. What a tragedy when someone's heart is so hard that they won't receive it. They're blind, aren't they? They're blind to the blessings. They're blind to all that God has for them. They're blind to understand the glory of it all. This is a great scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 to 4. Remember what Jesus said? When that seed falls on the hard ground and they refuse to take it in, like the devil comes and snatches it away. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 to 4. Even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world, that's the enemy, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Oh, how they're missing out. One last thing, I'll close with this. Hard hearts can be changed. I know this. I've seen hard hearts be changed. I hope that you are, are, are praying for those with hard hearts. Maybe they're on your impossible list. I've seen the impossible. I've seen those with hard hearts change. How does it happen? How is a hard heart changed? By being broken. That's the only condition that allows the seed to go into the heart and take root. If a farmer wants to sow in hard ground, what does he have to do first? He's got to plow it. He's got to break it. When I was younger, there was a song I used to love to sing. It was by Steve Camp. It was called Living in Laodicea. And the words were so powerful to me, I'd sit there and just sing them over and over and over because the words were a call to revival. They were a call to brokenness. And they went like this. Oh Lord, take your plow to my fallow ground. That's hard ground. Oh Lord, take your plow to my fallow ground. Let your blade dig down in the soil of my soul. For I've become dry and dusty. Oh, Lord, I know there must be richer lines below, for I've been living in Laodicea, and the fire that once burned bright, I've let it grow cold. It's a call, isn't it? It's a call to repentance. It's a call to come back. It's a call to come under the love of God. 
This woman, this woman in Luke 7 is an example of a heart that's broken. But that broken heart is receiving much. That broken heart is receiving forgiveness and receiving life and receiving grace and receiving compassion. She believed that God's heart would love her and give her compassion. You see, Psalm 51:17 says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Why? Because he knows that that's the beginning of wondrous transformation, wondrous blessing, when the hard heart is no longer hard. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for your word. You pour your life into us. And Lord, what we're understanding from your word here is that we need to open our hearts and receive it. Not resisting, not chafing against it, but welcoming with delight. Oh God, pour your life, pour your spirit, pour into us that we might have the life of God known and even overflowing in our lives. God, we want the fullness of your blessing, the fullness of your favor. And so we're asking that you would marvelously move. Church, isn't that the prayer of the day? I don't know where you are. I don't know what's happening in your life, but God does. And I know this, that God loves you. Do you have the faith to believe that his compassion over you is great, that his forgiveness for you is amazing? And that he wants to pour his love, he wants to pour his spirit, he wants to pour his life, he wants to transform. But what we need to do is to come under with delight, with anticipation, and say, Lord, I open my heart. Is that your prayer? Would you even just say that? Just even raise your hand and say, Lord, that's my prayer right there. I open my heart to receive. Pour, pour, pour your life, pour your spirit, pour newness. Pour forgiveness, pour compassion. Oh, pour it in, Lord. I need you. I need all that's behind the name of Jesus to bless my soul. Father, thank you for every, every sincere prayer you delight to answer. Oh, Lord, how amazing is your grace. How amazing is your love. And we receive it now in Jesus' name. And everyone said, can we give the Lord praise?